Howdy folks and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles and today we have a battle featuring the Italian premium tier 5 battleship the Giulio Cesare and it's played for us today by Bratin. This was one of three Conti de Cavour class dreadnought battleships built for the Italian Navy in the 1910s although in the 1930s she was heavily upgraded with more powerful guns, better armour and much, much faster engines. And that's the version that we have here in World of Warships. Technically, you could argue that this ship was actually undergunned in comparison to most other Tier 5 battleships. She's armed with 320mm guns. She's got 10 of them, but most other Tier 5 battleships are armed with 14-inch guns, 356mm guns, with the exception of the Germans. But while gun calibre is important, it isn't everything. Accuracy, consistency, shot grouping, sigma value, muzzle velocity, armour penetration values, these are all equally important. But while Julio here may only have 320mm guns, she does have 10 of them, and they are very reliable, with higher than average muzzle velocity of 830 meters per second, which means your shells don't take as long to get to the target, and you have nice flat firing arcs, making it, well, okay, not a great example. <laughs> it was the first salvo he fired. Uh, he seriously overestimated the speed of that target there. Um, but the higher muzzle velocity means that it's easier to hit targets at range. Um, you don't have to give as much lead, although the shells aren't particularly heavy. They weigh just over half a metric tonne. For comparison's sake, the 15-inch shells fired by the war spike weigh nearly twice that. But they do have that very, very fast muzzle velocity, and as you can see there, very nice tight shell grouping, thanks to the good dispersion and the better than average sigma rating. In case it wasn't obvious by the presence of the Fuso that he just shot at, this is a tier 6 battle. It's only a one-tier matchmaking spread in this particular battle, but Bratton is bottom tier. Not that this ship has ever really cared about that. And I'll explain why, right after Bratton finishes lining up his gun barrels on the Nuremberg, attempting to finish what he started earlier. Uh, quite successfully, I might add. <laughs> that's the first kill. Uh, first kill of the match, in fact. That's the first blood award. Yes, the reason that uh, the Giulio Cesare doesn't really care too much about whether or not it's top tier, middle tier, or bottom tier is because, well, not just the guns, but also the speed and the armour. It's not the most heavily armoured tier 5 battleship in the game, but the armour is decent. And it's not the fastest tier 5 battleship in the game. That award goes to the Congo, but it is the second fastest. Which means that, much like the way battle cruisers were meant to be employed, it's got the speed to get away from anything that can outgun it, and the guns to kill anything that can catch it. She may only be armed with 12.5 inch guns, but with the exception of the Congo, she can outrun anything that has bigger guns than her, and anything that can catch her, and we're talking cruisers here, are at best going to be armed with 8 inch guns, which she can comfortably outshoot. Actually, Jingles, what about the York at tier 7? This ship can fight that, and it has 210mm guns. They're not 8 inch, they're 8.2. Stop splitting hairs. 8 inch, 8.2, who cares? They're not 12.5, are they? So, yeah. And yet this ship isn't a battlecruiser. It was built as a dreadnought, and then it was modernised as a fast battleship. And yet it plays like a battlecruiser. Except a battlecruiser that also has armour. So, really doesn't play like a battlecruiser at all, does it? The Italian Navy in World War II really did have some very, very good ships. Couldn't afford to pay for them, or put them to sea, of course, but um, <laughs> that's just Mussolini all over for you. Build me some good ships, but we can't afford to pay for them. Don't come to me with problems, come to me with solutions, and make sure everybody has nice uniforms. Yeah. And yet, the fact that the Italian Navy existed was enough. Because Mediterranean convoys could be escorted by destroyers, frigates, destroyer escorts, and light cruisers to deal with the U-boat and air threat. But if you could be set upon by heavy cruisers and battleships at any time, 
you also had to provide heavy cruisers, battleships, and in some cases, aircraft carriers to escort your convoys. And that tied down huge numbers of resources. Just by existing, the Italian Navy was a massive threat in the Mediterranean theatre of operations, in the same way that the Tirpitz, just by existing, was a massive threat to the Arctic convoys. I mean, the Tirpitz only ever actually fired her guns in anger once. She shot up a Norwegian weather station <laughs> near Spitsbergen. Um, but just the fact that she could sail from those Norwegian fjords and attack an Arctic convoy at any time, even though she never actually did, but the fact that she could meant that the British Home Fleet had to be kept at a near permanent state of readiness in order to intercept her if she ever sailed out to fight. And the British Home Fleet couldn't be kept at a permanent state of readiness. Something that had disastrous consequences for convoy PQ-17 northbound to Bermansk, when the false news that the Tirpitz had sailed was reported, which led the Admiralty to order the convoy to scatter. And the whole point of sailing in convoy was so that the escorts could protect the merchantmen from attack by U-boats and aircraft. And the second the convoy scattered, they just got picked off one by one. Of the 35 ships that originally sailed to Murmansk in convoy PQ-17, only 11 made it. And that was just based on the threat of the Tirpitz sailing. A single battleship. The Italian Navy had more than one battleship, and it had a whole bunch of very capable heavy and light cruisers and destroyers as well. Admiral Cunningham, the commander of the British Mediterranean fleet, spent many a sleepless night trying to entice the Italian Navy out to fight and worrying about what might happen if they did and caught him off guard. There were two things that really hamstrung the Italian Navy in World War II, however. First, they didn't have any fuel, so if they were going to come out and fight, it had better be for a bloody good reason. The other thing was that they didn't have any radar, and the British did. And this led to... Well, they call it the Battle of Cape Matapan, but that's not really true, because a battle usually involves two sides shooting at each other. And, as you're going to see, that clearly wasn't the case. The events leading up to the battle were... how can I put this? Typically sneakily British. A cryptographer at Bletchley Park had made a breakthrough reading the Italian Naval Enigma Code, and had intercepted and decrypted a message that said, today's the day, minus three. This was followed three days later by a second message, which reported the sailing of an Italian battle fleet consisting of one battleship, six heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, plus escorting destroyers, to attack merchant convoys supplying British forces in Egypt and North Africa. Now, as is always the case with any kind of intelligence that you've received from breaking codes, you have to be very, very careful to not give the game away and alert the enemy to the fact that you are, in fact, reading their signal traffic. So, the British sent up a reconnaissance aircraft that just so happened, completely by accident, you understand, to happen to be in more or less the same area of the Mediterranean as this Italian fleet and was able to take pictures of it. So, we'd come up with a plausible reason to explain why we knew the Italian fleet had sailed. Now we had to actually get the British fleet out of Alexandria and in a position to intercept them without the Italians learning of the fact that the British fleet was sailing and doing what they'd done so many times before, turning around and just heading straight back to port. So, that night, Admiral Cunningham kept to his usual routine. He packed his suitcase and had his driver take him to his golf club, where he went for dinner every night. Except this time, as soon as he walked in the front door, he kept going straight out of the back door and sneaked back to Alexandria without being observed so he could board his flagship, HMS Warspite. And rather than the fleet sailing first thing in the morning, which was the normal routine, they caught the evening tide and sailed under cover of darkness. The Italians weren't helped by the fact that they'd also had a slight failure of intelligence of their own, although technically not their own, it wasn't really their fault. Italy got most of their intelligence from the Germans. And on this case, German intelligence had gotten some of the numbers of the British fleet just a little bit wrong. According to the Germans, the Mediterranean fleet at the time only had one operational battleship and no aircraft carriers. In fact, they had three battleships. And while it was true that the British carrier in the Mediterranean, HMS Illustrious, was damaged and not operational, it had just been replaced by HMS Formidable. So we very much did have an operational aircraft carrier as well. 
So Cunningham had sailed at night, undetected, with his carrier, his battleships and his heavy cruisers, and was sailing to rendezvous with a cruiser squadron commanded by Admiral Pridham Whipple. And on the morning of the 28th of March 1941, just south of the Greek island of Kavdos, this cruiser squadron was spotted by the Italian fleet, and the Battle of Cape Matapan began. Shots were fired by both sides. Nobody really hit anything, although some of the British cruisers were damaged by shell splinters. But that's about it for the initial contact off the island of Gavdos. However, with the position of the Italian fleet pinpointed, Cunningham was able to order airstrikes from HMS Formidable, consisting of ferry albacore torpedo bombers. Vittorio Veneto, the Italian battleship, was attacked without any real effect. But the Italian fleet's manoeuvring to avoid the torpedo attacks meant that they were forced to give up the pursuit of the cruiser squadron. A second airstrike was launched later that afternoon, and this time Lieutenant Commander John Daliel Stead, who was awarded the Distinguished Service Order, was able to get his albacore to within 1,000 metres of the Vittorio Veneto before firing off a torpedo, which hit her outer port propeller and caused 4,000 tonnes of flooding. Daliel Stead and his crew were killed when the aircraft was shot down by anti-aircraft fire from the Vittorio Veneto. These would be the only British casualties of the entire battle. While there was still daylight, a third air attack was launched, and this time, although they didn't manage to hit the Vittorio Veneto, they did manage to land a torpedo on the Italian cruiser Polar, which blew out five of her boilers, cut all electrical power, and forced her to come to a stop. Now at this point the Italians, because they weren't stupid, realised there was an aircraft carrier around, and where there's an aircraft carrier there are likely to be battleships. And with the damage already inflicted on the Vittorio Veneto, although the flooding had been brought under control, the Italian Admiral, Angelo Iacchino, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, had decided that was enough, enough was enough, it was time to turn around and head back to Taranto. However, he detached a squadron of cruisers and destroyers to escort the Polar. Confident that since night was about to fall, they would at the very least be able to get the Polar under tow and get some distance between themselves and any pursuit before daybreak. But they'd reckoned without one crucial technological advantage that the British possessed. Radar. Shortly after nightfall, at around about quarter past eight on the evening of the 28th of March 1941, the radar operators on HMS Orion picked up a ship around about six kilometres to port. This was the crippled Italian cruiser, the Polar. Shortly afterwards, at around about 10pm, the bulk of the British forces also picked up the squadron that had been sent to escort her. The Italians had no idea that they were about to be attacked by three battleships, seven light cruisers and 17 destroyers. They had no radar. The whole idea of fighting at night was completely alien to their way of thinking. Their guns weren't even ready for action. As far as the Italians were concerned, if they couldn't see a ship, there wasn't a ship there. And it was 10 o'clock at night, in the Mediterranean, in the middle of March. The battleships Barham, Valiant and Warspite, all Queen Elizabeth-class battleships armed with 15-inch guns, managed to close to within 3,800 yards. This is point-blank range for a battleship. You're practically firing over open sights before they open fire. Now it's important to note that while the British did have radar, so they were able to locate the positions of the Italian ships, they did not have radar-directed guns. So they still had to see the targets in order to train the guns on them. This is why they closed to 3,800 yards. And as the order to fire was given, the British ships illuminated the Italians with their searchlights. British gunners reported seeing Italian heavy cruiser turrets popping out of their mountings like champagne corks. Within three minutes, the Polar's sister ships, Fiume and Zara, had both been sunk. Two Italian destroyers were also sunk in the first five minutes, although a further two did manage to escape under the cover of a smokescreen, although one was heavily damaged. The Polar herself took no part in the fighting. She couldn't. She had no power. It was debated whether or not it was worth towing the Polar back to Alexandria as a prize, but with daylight approaching and the threat of air attack, it was decided that boarding parties would go aboard, loot her of anything valuable, and then her crew was taken off and she was sunk by torpedoes. The battle, if it can be really called a battle, resulted in damage to the Vittorio Veneto, the sinking of the three heavy cruisers Polar, Zara and Fiume, two Italian destroyers sunk, 
one Italian destroyer heavily damaged, more than 2,300 Italian sailors killed, and more than 1,000 Italian sailors taken prisoner. The price that the British Mediterranean fleet paid for this annihilation, effectively, of an entire cruiser division were four light cruisers, lightly damaged from shell splinters, one torpedo bomber shot down, with all three of its crew killed. Just to put the battle into context, during the entire course of World War II, the Royal Navy lost four heavy cruisers, HMS York, Exeter, Cornwall and Dorsetshire. At Matapan, the Italian Navy lost three in one night. And yet, despite the fact that this was the single greatest naval defeat that Italy had ever suffered, Cunningham was disappointed with the result. He wanted to bag the Vittorio Veneto as well, and was disappointed that his destroyers hadn't been able to maintain contact. And while we're on the subject of close-range big gun surface battles, the winner of this fight is going to be the one who can maintain trigger discipline, and it ain't the Frenchman who just fired into a heavily angled broadside. Instead, Bratin waits until he's got the flat broadside of his victim, and at that angle, it doesn't really matter if you only have 12.5 inch guns. You're going to tear right through the belt armour, and absolutely rip him apart. A bit like the Barham Valiant and Warspite waiting until they'd close to 3,800 yards of the Italian heavy cruiser squadron on the night of the 28th of March 1941, during the Battle of Cape Matapan. Bratton's trigger discipline, allowing him to pick up a high calibre there to go with his first blood double strike confederate and crack it unleashed. Oh, and did he just sneak another kill in at the end there? I do believe he did. <laughs> Seven kills. Blink and you might have missed it. Anyway, that's it for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.